Thank you for joining me as I continue my examination of the book Finding Truth by Nancy Piercy. In this video, I will be covering the next section of the book, which is titled Principle Number One, Twilight of the Gods. So Piercy begins with an anecdote about Dylan, a popular high school athlete who became a Christian during his senior year, but then found his faith shaken when he entered college and found himself taking science classes that taught Darwinian evolution as though it were a fact. Imagine that. And humanities courses that characterized his Christianity as just one of many possible personal choices rather than being objectively true. Outrageous. I mean, <laughs> how entitled can you get? Honestly, the poor guy was upset that his science classes taught evolution instead of what? The alternative theory? There isn't one. Science classes treat evolution as a fact because that's what it is. And the nerve of that humanities professor not to acknowledge that Dylan's personal faith was objectively true. Who the hell was this professor anyway? An educator charged with teaching a student body consisting of many people from diverse backgrounds with varying religious beliefs, all of whom the professor was ethically required to treat fairly? I mean, come on. Now, I'm not naive enough to believe that there aren't college professors who are legitimately intolerant jerks. Of course there are. But most of the complaints I hear from folks like Dylan and Nancy Piercy about how liberal and anti-Christian secular higher education has become sound less like the fault of sneering, condescending professors and more like the fault of Christian students offended that their Christianity isn't regarded at college the same way it's regarded at their church. Just imagine if Dylan had been a Muslim instead of a Christian, but made the same complaints. Would Nancy Piercy be as sympathetically outraged if she found out that a professor had declined to recognize Islam as objectively true? Something tells me she would not be nearly as upset or even upset at all. Anyway, Dylan went to a campus evangelical group uh, with his concerns, but he didn't find them to be any help. They told him to just read the Bible and stop asking questions. A little bit later, he took a trip to Europe and wound up spending about a year in Switzerland studying at Labrie, which is the evangelical center founded by Francis Schaeffer. And after studying with Schaeffer for about a year, and again, this must have been a while ago because Francis Schaeffer died in 1984, uh, Dylan had new confidence in his faith because while studying with the other students and teachers at Labrie, he discovered that Christianity had a uh, intellectual viability, that it could be defended rationally. And Piercy writes that it's a mistake for Christians to teach young people that their doubts about their faith should be ignored or answered with more intense devotion instead of trying to explore the questions. Questions and doubt are natural. And instead of trying to drown them out with more devotion and more faith, they should be addressed. And on this point, Piercy and I agree, or at least we seem to. It's a common strategy among apologists, I've noticed, to disparage other Christians who run from doubt or who are unable or unwilling to carry on an intellectual defense of the faith. But the problem is that apologetics is presented as a valid intellectual defense when, so far as I've ever seen, it's nothing of the kind. Apologists like Piercy declare that Christians uh, who have doubts or questions should face their doubts and face their questions, and those questions should be explored and answered honestly, but then the apologists answer those questions by misrepresenting science and teaching people to respond to arguments against their religion with rhetorical tricks that shut down discussion rather than facilitate understanding. That's not intellectual. And that's not honest, yet it seems to be all that apologists are capable of doing. Well, Piercy writes that according to a recent study, 
32% of teenagers who leave the church say that they do so because they feel that Christianity doesn't make sense or that it doesn't have satisfactory answers to their questions or that it lacks scientific proof. The solution to this problem, Piercy says, is for church youth groups to start teaching apologetics. Quote, Parents are rightly concerned about the risk involved in exposing their children to non-biblical perspectives, but there is also a risk in raising children who think the only way they can test their mettle is by breaking away from their family and church. Competing worldviews often appear more attractive when they acquire the allure of the forbidden. The only way teens become truly prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks, 1 Peter 3.15, is by struggling personally with the questions. And what better place to expose young people to non-biblical worldviews than a Christian youth group, where they'll be presented with those worldviews in the most biased and dishonest way imaginable, so that the truth and total supremacy of Christianity will always be a foregone conclusion. Intellectualism. Oh, hold up, I probably should have read a little bit further before I said that. Quote, it is far better for young people to explore the fascinating world of ideas with parents, teachers, and church leaders as guides who can give them the tools to think critically and think well. Well, I just did my bit on that a second ago, so I'll let you all fill in your own snarky comments on that one. Okay, uh, so after that extended preamble, we now come to the actual subject of this chapter, which is the first principle, which was mentioned in the summary given in the introduction in the previous video. You might remember that the first principle is identify the idol. And idols can be anything that stand in the place of God in a non-biblical worldview. People who reject God will create an idol to replace him, according to Nancy Piercy, and everyone who doesn't believe in God does this, because it says so in the book of Romans. And I wonder if that would fall under the category of thinking critically, or perhaps thinking well, or maybe it's a floater. I think it's a floater. Piercy cites the literary critic Terry Eagleton, who writes that not believing in God is far more difficult than people often think, because if you don't believe in God, then you've got to put something in God's place. In other words, create an idol. And this chapter goes on for a bit, and I'll cover all of it uh, as we move along, but I feel compelled to stop right here and point out that the entire premise of this first principle is faulty. The idea is that if you don't believe in God, then you have to create an idol in his place because you just can't make sense of the world or have any fulfillment or purpose in life unless you have either God or something taking God's place. And for Christians like Piercy, it follows that anything other than God placed in the place of God leads to hopelessness. That's why Christianity is the only ultimately coherent and valid worldview. But let's just sidestep that for now and focus on God. Is God so necessary that he has to be replaced by something else if he is taken out of a worldview or if a worldview simply never includes him to begin with? Or can we just do without him altogether? Is there really any need to replace God with an idol? Because see, the thing is, Many of us who don't believe in God, who have worldviews that do not include or require God to be there, don't replace God with one thing. We have countless replacements for the things that God supposedly does. And we could consider this uh, in terms of Piercy's God or any one of the countless other gods that other people believe in. Because when you really look at it, God doesn't actually do anything. He gets credit for lots of stuff. And folks like Piercy will define him in such a way that he occupies this central position in all of existence. But by doing that, they're just doing what apologists usually do, which is to attempt to demonstrate they've already won the argument so that they don't have to actually have the argument. We don't need God to explain where the universe comes from or why it works the way it does. Cosmology and physics do a fine job of that, though, of course, there will still be unanswered questions. 
We don't need God to explain where we came from or why we are the way we are. We have biology and neuroscience and psychology and sociology and other such disciplines through which to explore and answer more often than not those questions. We don't need God to give our lives meaning or purpose. We each have the ability to search for and hopefully find that meaning for ourselves in many different ways from many different sources, including work and family, friends, art, numerous other possibilities. We don't need God to tell us how to behave or to help us discern right from wrong. We can do that just fine by ourselves, not always as individuals necessarily, but most of us don't live in isolation. We live in communities where at our best, we learn to care for, value, and protect each other. Now, it's true that some of us look to God, the God of a particular church or tradition, or sometimes just a sort of general concept of God, sort of a deistic God or a pantheistic God, depending on the tradition that you choose to follow. Uh, we can sometimes look to God for these things, but belief in God isn't necessary for any of them. And since God doesn't really do anything, there's no need to replace him with an idol for your world to make sense. You can take all of the things that God supposedly does and just turn them back over to the various processes and experiences that take care of them anyway. A great deal of apologetics is about defending the premises that God is necessary and irreplaceable and Christianity is unavoidably objectively true. But the problem is those aren't conclusions that you reach following an honest, unbiased investigation. Those are your starting points and they're also your end points. Apologetics wants you to start at that place where Christianity is necessarily true and God is central and unavoidable and then you're never supposed to move from that spot. You're just supposed to fend off arguments that try to move you or try to get you to start from somewhere else. And that's not really an investigation and it's not really an intellectual exercise, although it does its best to take that shape. Anyway, Piercy says, quote, Secular people often accuse Christians of having faith while claiming that they themselves base their convictions purely on facts and reason. Not so. If you press any set of ideas back far enough, eventually you reach an ultimate starting point, something that is taken as the self-existent reality on which everything depends. This starting assumption cannot be based on prior reasoning, because if it were, you could ask where that reasoning starts, and so on, in an infinite regress. At some point, every system of thought has to say, this is my starting point. There is no reason for it to exist. It just is. She's talking there about first principles. She doesn't use that term, but that appears to be what she's getting at. And the thing is, you can't just declare any old thing a first principle. If you want God, and not just any God or a generic deity, but the specific God you believe in to be regarded as a first principle, then you first have to explain how your God must exist, how your God's existence is necessary and self-evident, because that's what a logical first principle is. There's no reasoning explaining where it comes from or why it's true because you have reached a point in your logic where it simply must be true, where you can't do any reasoning beyond that point unless this given point or this given set of points is true. So you have to establish that God, your God, is of that nature. If you don't, then you can't expect other people to treat it as a first principle. You don't get to say, well, I don't have to explain my reasoning as to how I figured out God exists. God has to exist. First principle, ultimate starting point. So I don't have to have any prior reasoning. In fact, I'm kind of not allowed to have prior reasoning. What with God being a first principle and all. Ha 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 ha. I mean, that, that seems to be the game that's being played and it just doesn't work that way. Also, basing your reasoning on a self-evident first principle is not the same thing as believing in a particular religion's God. Piercy is confusing two different kinds of faith, and not for the last time in this chapter, I might add. The faith, if you would even call it that, that one might have in the truth of a first principle, such as, I exist. 
That's an okay first principle to start with. That's not the same kind of faith that a religious person has in the existence of their God. A religious belief is a kind of faith that exists in the absence of evidence or sometimes in defiance of evidence to the contrary of the thing that is believed. And that's not the same thing as belief in a first principle. A first principle is something, logically speaking, that must be true for everything else to make sense. And the existence of the Christian God is simply not such a belief, no matter how hard Nancy Piercy or other apologists will strain to make it appear that way. That just isn't what it is. In fact, God can't be your ultimate starting point. Even if you really want the Christian God to be the ultimate first principle for everything else, the, 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 the foundation for your worldview and your reasoning. It can't be, because there are a few assumptions that you have to make before you get to the point of believing in any particular God, or indeed, in anything else about the world outside your own mind. You have to believe that you exist. You have to believe that your reasoning is valid, that your senses are reliable, that the things you see and hear and, and perceive about the world around you are essentially accurate and can be acted upon and will make sense. These are, these are all the assumptions that are built in to any belief about the outside world, even a belief that you consider to be as fundamental and basic as the existence of God. You can't trust your own belief in the existence of God until you trust the underlying assumptions that stand beneath that belief and hold it up. So belief in God cannot be a first principle. It just doesn't work that way. Next, in a section of the chapter subtitled Religion Without God, Piercy elaborates on a point that she made in the introduction, namely that everything is a religion. Don't have a religion, you have a religion. Your religion might not have a creator God or a moral code or a form of ritual worship, but if you acknowledge something as divine, you have a religion. And according to Piercy, everyone acknowledges that something is divine. Quote, as a result, religions are a lot more like philosophies than most people think. And philosophies are a lot like religions. Structurally, both start with a set of postulates about what is ultimately real or divine. Think of the divine as whatever is furthest back beyond or behind everything else. You see that little slide that she does there? She says that all religions acknowledge the divine, and then she says that philosophies are a lot like religions because they acknowledge the real or the divine. And the divine is just whatever is back there beyond everything else. So by that rationale, if I believe, for example, that the ultimate reality is the physical universe that we inhabit, that there is nothing above or beyond it, then I'm saying the universe is divine. And since I have acknowledged something as divine, I have a religion. I have made an idol of the universe. And this to me removes any specific meaning from the term divine, if it can mean basically anything. It's, it's a kind of wordplay, it's a kind of word game, again, that apologists do a lot, taking a term that has a fairly well-known, widely agreed upon meaning and saying, yeah, but it also means this. And that definition is so broad that it will necessarily encompass pretty much anything that the apologist needs it to encompass. Percy's worldview is so rigged in her own favor that people simply aren't allowed to disagree with her about certain things. I might say that I reject the existence of the divine, but she defines divinity so broadly that it can mean pretty much anything. Therefore, I must believe in the divine, even if I say that I don't. I can't reject religion. I can't not have an idol in the place of God because she has built the world in such a way that I have no other choice. And I remind you, this is the person who wants to teach children to learn apologetics so they'll know how to think well. Percy describes how early Western philosophers attempted to explain the world without appealing to the gods by finding the first cause, the necessary stuff of existence, which was called the Arche. 
They had different ideas on what the Arche was. Some thought it was a classical element like water or fire or air. Some thought it was mathematics, but they agreed that it was something. Quote, does the Greek concept of the Arche fit the biblical definition of an idol? Clearly. Whereas scripture asserts that all things hold together in Christ, Colossians 1.17, the early philosophers sought to identify some principle imminent within the cosmos that provided an underlying unity that functioned as their ultimate explainer. Though they rejected the Olympian gods, the pre-Socratics still held a concept of the divine. So, because the writers of the Bible and the early philosophers were both trying to do basically the same thing, but one appealed to Christ and the other appealed to something within the cosmos, obviously it was the philosophers who were doing a watered-down version of what the Christians were doing, or rather would do, because she's talking about pre-Socratic philosophers who lived centuries before the time of Jesus. If you start with my way is the right way and anyone who does it any other way is just doing a bad imitation of my way, then of course you're going to inevitably reach the conclusion that you're right. It's a little arrogant to just define your way as the transcendent standard by which all ways that came before and after should be judged though. I mean, that's just what I think. Next, Piercy examines what she calls the Church of Physics and its idol, which is matter. See, everything is a religion, even science. In fact, Piercy might even say especially science. Quote, The prevailing view among the new atheists, along with much of the academic world, is scientific materialism. Materialism is committed to the dogma that physics explains all of chemistry, chemistry explains all of biology, and biology explains the human mind, with nothing left over. Therefore, physics alone explains the human mind. Physics is the ultimate explainer. But is this view itself religious? Is it a divinity claim? Without a doubt. And Piercy goes on to support her claim that materialism is a religion by quoting John Searle, saying there is a sense in which materialism is the religion of our time, explaining that he believes a material explanation for the origin of life will one day be found, and that his confidence in this matter comes from his faith in science, a faith he describes as well-founded, but faith nonetheless. So checkmate, atheists. Piercy treats this as an admission from Searle that materialism is his religion. She is demonstrating a selective inability to recognize when someone is speaking figuratively. There's a sense in which materialism is the religion of our time is not the same as saying materialism is a religion. Also, once again, she's confusing kinds of faith. Searle describes his faith in science which is based on his experience, which tells him that science is capable of answering questions like where did life come from? And this isn't a dogmatic belief rooted in received information. This is a belief based in past experience, a belief that has been tested and proven to be reasonable, a familiarity with science and its methods, knowing that it is capable, that it is, in fact, the only method known to us that is capable of exploring and answering such questions. And this is very different from religious faith, but Piercy seems to want to treat all forms of belief as though they were religious faith. So the belief that science will someday be able to determine the origin of life is an article of religious faith. And how far does that go? If I believe my truck will start when I turn the key because that's what's always happened before and I know of no reason to expect that it won't, is that a religious belief? If I believe the cat will curl up on the couch and take a nap after I feed her because that's what she always does, is that a religious belief? If an astronomer predicts that the sun will rise in his part of the world at precisely 7.06 a.m. because he's using a predictive model that has been proven over and over and over again to be accurate, is that an act of religious faith? Piercy might try to insist that it is, but I hope most people would be able to see the difference between a belief based on past testing, past experience, 
and a belief based on nothing other than received information and prophecy and church tradition and wishful thinking. Well, still on the subject of materialism, Piercy turns to one of the denominations, as she calls it, of this religion, which is Marxism. How does materialism lead to Marxism? Well, Piercy says, because if matter is all there is, then people relate to matter through the things they make out of it. And Marxism is all about who controls the making of things or the means of production. Thus, in Marxism, economic conditions become the archy or the ultimate explainer. And if you recognize an ultimate explainer, you've got a religion. Checkmate, Marxists. Well, there are certain forms of Marxism, certain movements rooted in it that could be fairly described as religious or at least cultish. The cults of personality cultivated around communist leaders in the Soviet Union and China and Cuba throughout much of the 20th century, for example. But Piercy is arguing that Marxism itself is by definition a religion because it holds economics up as the ultimate explainer. Of course, Marxism doesn't hold that economics is the ultimate explainer of everything, just of how humans relate to one another in society. And many Marxists, including Karl Marx himself, have not been terribly fond of religion in general, which makes it all the more silly that Piercy would try to argue that Marxism is itself a religion. Another denomination of the religion of materialism, according to Piercy, is empiricism. And she explores the problems of empiricism by talking about Star Trek. So this is two apologetics books in a row where the author has referenced Star Trek. Though something tells me I won't find this one as endearing as when Holly Ordway talked about her Star Trek fandom in the previous series. Just, just a guess on my part. Piercy discusses David Hume, uh, who once famously or infamously among Christian apologists said that if a book contains neither abstract nor experimental reasoning that is relevant to our existence in the world, commit it to the flames. Piercy says that Hume makes an idol of the sensory realm and references how popular and oft-cited he is among philosophers at universities. Now comes the Star Trek bit. Piercy refers to the Next Generation episode, Rightful Heir, where Worf goes on a religious retreat and he is shocked to encounter a man who appears to be the great mytho-historical Klingon warrior Kalis, who died centuries earlier, but supposedly prophesied that he would return one day. Now it appears at first that Kalis has indeed returned as he promised he would. And Piercy relates a scene in that episode where Data and Worf discuss the apparent return of Kalis, and Data wants to know about the empirical evidence that would substantiate Kalis's claim that he's the real deal. But Worf says that this is not a matter of, of empirical evidence, it's a matter of faith. And so Data replies to that by basically saying, well, I need some evidence, son, because I'm not programmed for that kind of faith. And Piercy points out that there are all these naturalistic, materialist assumptions laced throughout the dialogue in that scene, that the supernatural cannot be proven by rational means, that it's purely a matter of faith, that it can't be substantiated empirically. And she says, quote, by contrast, if you asked Christians for empirical evidence that Jesus was the Messiah, they would probably list historical evidence for his resurrection factual evidence for the claims of the New Testament, manuscript evidence for the reliability of the biblical text, archaeological evidence for the events in scripture, and so on. The Christian message rests on events that could be seen, heard, touched. 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. Well, that's a little inaccurate. The Christian message rests on events that could have been seen, heard, or touched by the people in their immediate vicinity when they happened, if indeed they did happen. But even if they did happen, people alive today are completely cut off from them. They are completely unsubstantiated to people alive today. I've heard many examples which Christians claim to be evidence for the resurrection, the miracles of the New Testament, etc. But I've never seen anything that actually qualifies as compelling evidence. There's a lot of hearsay, 
There are numerous attempts to use easily verifiable but relatively mundane historical details found in the Bible to argue that the completely unfounded claims of miracles ought to be accepted right along with everything else. But there's nothing, and I mean literally nothing, not a few things, not one or two things, not a single piece of evidence, of supposed evidence that I have ever heard that has turned out to be what the apologist presenting it claims it to be. Real, compelling, persuasive evidence for the divinity of Jesus, the resurrection, the miracles, the truth of the doctrine of salvation, or indeed the truth of any of the central, fundamental, supernatural claims of Christianity. Piercy gets a little dig in at Star Trek, talking about the materialist assumptions in the scene between Data and Worf. And I honestly don't blame her for that, because if I were a Christian apologist, I wouldn't like that episode either, because it ends with Kalos turning out to be a fraud. It's revealed that he's a clone created by the religious order that operates the monastery Worf was visiting. And even though he'd begun to believe in Kalos as the real thing, when Worf sees the evidence to the contrary, when he sees the evidence that Kalos is a clone and he has not been supernaturally resurrected, Worf accepts it. He accepts that this new Kalos is a fraud and he lets go of his religious belief in the face of evidence that tells him it isn't true. And that is the one thing that Christian apologists want to avoid. That is the one thing that Christian apologists hope that their audience will never do. And that is to abandon their religious belief in the face of evidence telling them that it cannot be true. Next, Piercy complains that materialists rule out the supernatural by definition. She writes that no matter how strong the evidence for a supernatural claim, materialists will reject any claim that there exists something beyond the realm of empirical science. And this is a little confusing to me because if there is strong evidence for a supernatural claim, shouldn't it then be verifiable by empirical science? What is the nature of this evidence that is incredibly persuasive, but totally invisible to science? How is that even supposed to work? Never mind asking for examples. Explain to me how that even makes sense. Also, as I've said before, if religious folks want their claims of the supernatural to be taken seriously rather than dismissed, all they have to do is demonstrate the validity of one supernatural claim just one. Just prove that it's a sound concept, because no one has ever been able to do even that. Everything that has ever been definitively explained has been found to have a natural, scientifically verifiable explanation. There are no verified supernatural phenomena. None. There are unexplained phenomena that some people assume must be supernatural, and there are explained natural phenomena that people insist are supernatural out of ignorance or dishonesty, but there are no verified supernatural phenomena. All Piercy and her fellow apologists need is one, just to show that such things are possible. But so far they haven't got that not a single verifiable supernatural phenomenon ever in the history of human existence. That is suggestive to me. <laughs> Perhaps Nancy Piercy would say it shouldn't be suggestive to me, but that is extremely suggestive to me. They haven't got a single verifiable supernatural phenomenon. What they have got is a staggering lack of self-awareness, to wit, quote, yet to define what is rational solely by whether it fits the tenets of your own worldview is an invalid move because it rules out all other truth claims by definition. You do not even have to investigate the evidence. A serious search for truth does not start by stacking the deck. Is that a fact? So, Arguing that people who don't believe in God are just replacing him with idols, which can be just about anything. Arguing that 
everything is a religion and that Christianity is a necessarily true worldview that people with other worldviews have to borrow from to justify their reasoning, these things are not forms of deck stacking, but requiring evidence before accepting that a given claim is true and seeking natural explanations for phenomena in what appears from all indications to be a natural world. These are forms of deck stacking. Got it. I understand completely. Piercy then spends several pages detailing how empiricism and rationalism both ultimately leave us trapped inside our own minds, reliant solely on our senses and our reasoning to perceive and understand the world all around us. And after taking several more pages to then address and dismiss romanticism for similar reasons, which she says makes an idol of the imagination, romanticism, Piercy finally comes around to the better way that Christianity offers. Because the problem with these other worldviews is that they make idols out of things in creation. Quote, by contrast, Christianity does not start with anything in creation. It begins with the transcendent creator. Therefore, it is not limited in scope. It does not have to reduce all of reality to a single set of categories. It does not see just the trunk or the tusk or the tail. It is a transcendent point of view that sees the whole elephant, the God's eye view that philosophers and mystics have always sought. Though you and I are limited in our individual perspectives, we have access to the perspective of eternity. And how do you access that perspective? How do you know that perspective is what the Bible claims it to be? How do you know that perspective even exists? Do not your reason and senses come into play there? Piercy, who, as I mentioned in the previous video, is a presuppositionalist, disparages other philosophies because they leave us trapped inside our minds, but she doesn't seem to realize that Christianity has exactly the same problem. She repeatedly refers to the Bible as a source of wisdom and truth beyond human understanding or human limitation, but one has to read the Bible before one can discover and comprehend its truth, correct? And the senses and the rational mind would be necessary to the act of reading, would they not? Even if we accept that God can reveal things to people directly through personal revelation, there is still the trapped in our minds problem, because how do we come to recognize that God has revealed something to us? How do we comprehend its meaning? How do we determine whether what we think we've received is a genuine divine revelation and not some form of delusion or deception? How do we decide what we then should do in response to the revelation that we have received? Piercy seems to think that Christianity is superior to other worldviews in this way because Christians imagine that they have access to an omniscient and infallible source. But even if that's true, the knowledge from that source is still filtered through our brains the same way everything else is, which means we will always be at the mercy of our senses and our reason, and there will always be the possibility that our senses and our reason aren't giving us reliable information, and that what we think we know is not actually true. And this is just an innate, inescapable part of the human condition. This is an uncertainty which we all have to live with, even Christians who have convinced themselves otherwise. Well, Piercy wraps up this chapter by reviewing all the ways in which non-Christian philosophies fail while Christianity succeeds. The great thing about Christianity, she says, is that it allows people to appreciate the truth and beauty in the world and to learn from and appreciate the insights in science and philosophy and other worldviews. And then she writes, quote, all the while, we should be making the case that whatever is genuinely good and true finds its true home within Christianity. Every ism isolates one strand from the rich fabric of truth. Christianity alone provides, the gr provides what the greatest philosophers and sages have sought all along, a coherent 
and transcendent framework that encompasses all of human knowledge. Remember, Christians, don't forget, everything good and true belongs to Christianity, and Christianity alone among all religions and philosophies provides a framework that can account for all human knowledge. And also remember, don't stack the deck in your favor. Well, that is it for this video. That's it for principle number one. In the next video in this series, I will return with a look at the next chapter, which deals with principle number two, which is titled, How Nietzsche Wins. That is not the name of the actual principle, but that's the name of the chapter devoted to exploring that principle, How Nietzsche Wins. So that will be in the next video. Thank you all as always for watching this video. I hope you got something out of this. I hope you found this entertaining or informative or of some use somehow. If you have something to say in response to something I have had to say in this video, please do leave a comment down below. Uh, tell me I got something right. Tell me I got something wrong. Tell me I really, really blew it or that I was just brilliant in this one particular bit. I'm very interested to hear your reactions to something that I have said in this video. Uh, and also, if you enjoy this video and you enjoy what I do, please do like and share and subscribe to this channel. And if you think I'm worth it and if you can afford it, please consider becoming a supporter of this channel through Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash Steve Shives to become a patron of this channel. For as little as $1 a month, you can become a patron and that really, really helps me out. And if you are able to pledge at a level beyond $1 a month at $5 a month or $10 a month or even higher, there are some really cool perks available for those of you who are able to pledge at that level to show my appreciation. And one of the perks at the $5 level is that if you pledge at that level, not only do you get a shout out in a future video in my Facepalm 5 series, but you also are able to view scripts of selected videos, including videos in this series. I post the scripts for the An Atheist Reads videos uh, on my Patreon feed for $5 subscribers or higher uh, the day before I actually post the video. So you get a little sneak peek and you get to read my notes and, and you have it in written form in addition to this uh, video form. This was previously a $10 a month uh, perk, but I have rearranged my reward system a little bit lately, so it's now a $5 a month perk. So those of you who think I'm worth it and can afford it might want to take advantage of that. Um, thank you as always for watching, and I'll see you next time.